If you would, please turn with me to the book of Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3. And uh, we're going to have a little bit of a sword drill tonight. We're going to be Old Testament. We'll be New Testament. We'll be Old Testament. We'll be New Testament. Okay, not just like this, but, but we're going to use the Word of God tonight. You know, October 10th happens to be... Uh, yes, thank you. Happens to be... The second week in October, which technically classifies Pastor Appreciation Day. Okay? Since Pastor is not here for Pastor Appreciation Day, let's talk about our pastor on Pastor Appreciation Day. So the title of the message tonight is Pastor Appreciation Day, Honoring Our Pastor. Honoring Our Pastor. That's what we want to do, is it not? In the book of Jeremiah chapter 3, is everybody there? Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 15. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse number 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Pastor Appreciation Day, honoring our pastor. Father, we thank you for our pastor Father, we know he's away from us, but his heart is very much here. We pray that you just be with us tonight as we open your word. Father, that we'll not turn a deaf ear to it. But Father, we'll have that which you give us. Father, always help us to love and respect our pastor because we know you gave him to us. Father, we pray that again as we open your word that Satan will be defeated, that Christ will be honored. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, this thought tonight is not going to be anything new. It is, however, sometimes good to rehearse the basic Bible teachings and Bible truths in God's Word. And uh, tonight, uh, we'd we'd like to rehearse this Bible truth regarding our pastor. Now, I know personally that you love your pastor because you proved that last week. And I know you do. But I want you to know and understand that although he has only been senior pastor now for eight years, he has been our pastor for 22 years. And what I love about our pastor is when he was needed to stand and fill in the pulpit, he was there. But when his pastor was able to be here, he just kind of went back into the shadows and allowed, although he was co-pastor, although he had the, the, uh, the right and the responsibility as pastor, he went and let the senior pastor take take the, the duty he had. And as soon as, as, soon as uh, uh, our former pastor retired, he stepped right in ready to go. And now for eight years he's been leading us and he's been, he's been uh, instructing us in God's righteousness and God's ways. And there's some things I want you to understand. First things first is God has placed him here at Bible Baptist Church. And... Uh, whether you like to, to believe it or not, a pastor cannot go wherever he wants to go. He goes where he is sent. Amen. If you would, turn with me to the book of John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And uh, I want you to understand that if a pastor decides to go wherever he wants to go, that the ministry is going to fail. It will fail. Because he's not in proper, uh, in tune with his God. Now, you say, well, there's those pastors that come in and they, they, they leave every two years. Or they'll come every one year, every three years, whatever the case may be. My problem with this is this. How can a pastor truly uh, understand a people and truly lead a people if they're not there long enough to know the people? Now, I'm not going to say that a pastor cannot be called somewhere else after a short time because I'm not he of the Holy Spirit. But I also understand that a pastor has been placed into a church to lead and to instruct in righteousness the congregation that which God has given him. Okay? In John chapter 15, verse number 16, this is what the Bible says. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask in my Father's name, he may give you. 
So we know that, that it's God that, that picks out the pastor. It's God that places the pastor. We know that if we go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11, we know that uh, 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 we see that it all started in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave some apostles. We know that's where it all started. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Verse 12, why, why is this? Well, just like I told you, it's for instructing and, and encouraging God's people to, to, uh, to, to lead them in a godly manner. We see in verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 4, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, again, if he does not follow the Lord, the ministry will fail. You say, well, I don't necessarily believe that because there's always somebody else that can and I disagree with that. Because if God has placed a pastor in a place to pastor, he needs to be the pastor. He doesn't need people coming in and, and overshadowing him. He needs to be the one that's in front of the people. He needs to be the one that is leading the charge. Now, we can, we can be alongside with him, linking arms together, but it's after we're following his leadership. You say, well, can you give me an example of this? I sure can. Remember Jonah? He was supposed to go one place. He decided to go somewhere else. And God, one way or the other, God's going to get his way. You know, so why not just follow the Lord from the very beginning? And I believe our pastor truly follows the Lord. Now, as a church, what are our responsibilities to our pastor? Like I said, this is going to be nothing new tonight. You all know this. But sometimes, like I said, it's just good to rehearse. What are the responsibilities of the church to the pastor? Well, first of all, we are to honor the under-shepherd. We know that Christ is the great shepherd, and he has placed the pastor as the under-shepherd to watch over our souls. But we do need to honor the under-shepherd. If you would go to, uh, if you would turn with me, please, to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Are you turning? I don't hear any pages. Are you turning with me? In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you say, well, how do we honor the under-shepherd? How do we honor our pastor? Well, first of all, we need to honor him by, by esteeming him in the Lord. We esteem him in the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for the work's sake. You say, well, I don't necessarily always agree with the pastor. Well, that's okay. If he's preaching the word of God, it's not him you have the problem with. It's the word of God. And how do you, rem how do you uh, uh, fix that? Where's the remedy there? You find yourself at the old-fashioned altars getting yourself right with God. It's only been by the grace of God that whoever stands behind this pulpit for 83 years has, has proclaimed the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, all it takes is one person to get up here and, and forfeit that streak. It takes one person to get up here and completely ruin a church. I don't believe that is our pastor's heart. I believe he loves you and I, I believe he wants to see this church uh, catch fire for God. We also honor the Lord by remembering Him and by obeying Him as unto the Lord. You know, I say as unto the Lord because I want you to understand, although we esteem Him highly for the work's sake, He is a man. And He will make mistakes. But if He is leading us in the way that we should go as unto the Lord, we need to remember that and we need to obey that. In the book of Hebrews chapter 13, in the book of Hebrews chapter 13, Verse number 7, Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7, we honor him by remembering him and by obeying his words. Now you say, well, how do we remember him? First of all, we remember him in prayer. When was the last time, I wonder, that you actually pay, uh, you prayed for your pastor? You know, we need to pray for him on a daily basis. You think you've got struggles, try being the pastor of a church. You say, well, what do you know about it? I don't know, I'm not a pastor. You know, those of us that work with him every day, we can see what he's going through, but yet we still truly don't understand what actually goes into it because we are not the pastor. I want you to understand that. We can see what's going on. We can see the work that he's got in it. But while we're home asleep, 
while we're home with our kids, playing with our kids, while we are uh, uh, out having a good time, he's taking care of problems. He's studying for the next week's messages. He's counseling somebody. Why? Because he is our pastor. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. I want you to understand, when you come to your pastor and you, and you, and you lay your burdens upon him, you, and you say, well, I don't like the counsel he's given me. Well, the word of God says to consider the end of the conversation. You know what, he, he, might, he might not personally understand that those things that you're going through, but let me tell you, he's in tune with his God. And he will have the answer that, that you need from the word of God. Because he is in tune with God. In verse 17, the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. We need to submit ourselves uh, to our pastor as unto the Lord. We need to be loyal to him and his leadership. Amen. How many people do you hear that will badmouth their preacher? How many people do you hear that will badmouth their bosses? How many people do you hear that will badmouth their spouses or their children or the children, their parents? And there's, an, there's never anything good to say. Have you ever noticed that? Negativity will go faster than positivity. Isn't that right? But in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says something, says something to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number uh, uh, 16. Now, remember the, the, the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, they were having a little bit of trouble. And the book of 1 Corinthians is really a letter of uh, correction. And Paul is sitting there and he's giving them an example. And, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 16, the Bible says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. You know, if our pastor is opening up the word of God and he's sharing the word of life, we need to stand behind him. There's no reason why our pastor, when he's opening up the word of God, he should have to hold up this sign. There is no reason for this sign. Because we as Christians should be so in tune with the Lord and so in tune with what the pastor is saying that we're ready to say amen before he finishes the sentence. That's how it should be. Are you that in tune with your God? Are you that involved in a message? Or is it one of those things that the pastor has to come out and he has to say, what, remember, did you hear what I just said? Hey, did you hear what I just, okay, hold on. He shouldn't have to do that during his message. We should be attentive. We need to be following him every verse. We need to be listening to every word because we are uh, uh, following his example. But Paul doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just say, uh, wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. But if you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he, he, he further uh, solidifies this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1, he says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now let me ask you here tonight, do you truly believe that your pastor is following God? Do you really? Do you believe that your pastor is in tune with He, the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that your pastor goes and prays about the messages that he's going to present? Do you think that pastor goes and diligently prays throughout the week for, for you all? Do you think he diligently prays for the lost? He does. There's been times I've been riding with him and we'll be going across town and uh, uh, I can't get a word in because he's on the phone. We went up to Colorado to see a pastor and more times than not I was sitting there just counting the windmills because he's on the phone talking to somebody. Brother Jerry, is this true? Brother Jerry went down with him to Oklahoma City, came back, and I, I called him. I, I can never get through on the phone. He's always on the phone with somebody. But what's he doing? He's trying to instruct. He's trying to encourage. You know, he calls pastors all over America just to encourage them, just to say, hey, don't forget, there's a church, a Bible Baptist church in Enid that loves you. Amen. You know, he reaches out to other pastors on your behalf. Do you love those other pastors that have not cowered to the whims of the world? Amen. Do you love those other churches that are standing true? You should. We're like faith and order. But you know, he deserves our godly and biblical. Uh, uh, his desires are godly and his desires are biblical. 
You know, there's only been one goal that has not been reached that he has placed before uh, uh, when, he, when he became senior pastor. He wanted to see, he wanted to see uh, preachers sent out of their church. We, we've, we've done that. We've got another one getting ready to go. He wants to see souls saved. We're seeing souls saved. He's wanting to see the baptismal water stirred. We're seeing those baptismal waters stirred. He wants to see our church catch a revival. We've caught revival. He wants, to see, he wants to see us grow. We've grown. There's only one thing that we have not reached yet, and that's reaching 100 for visitation. That is the only goal that, that he has set that we have not obtained. And that's to our shame. That's not to his shame. That's to our shame. You say, well, I've got better things to do on Tuesday night. you got better things to do than serve your God? You've got better things to do than, than, than try to reach your lost friends and neighbors to, to, to go out and reach the community for Christ? You've got better things to do than that? We need to check our things that we love. But you know what I love about our pastor? He has always led by example. Up until he started, uh, start, started to feel real bad. You know, he was the first one here and the last one to leave. He's out there shaking hands, telling, telling y'all how much he loves you. Does he not? He stands up behind the pulpit and says, folks, you know I love you. Does he not? He is always led by example. Why, why can't we not just lock arms with him and, and follow his leadership and see great things done for Bible Baptist Church? You know, in, in part of being loyal to, to him and his leadership, we also need to show our pastor and his wife the respect they deserve. You say, what comes to this? Well, you know, first things first is we need to address them properly. Before, when he was on staff, he says, oh, just call me Terry. Just call me Brother Terry. Oh, that's Cheryl with an S. How many times have you heard him say that? But you know, the proper way to address your pastor is Brother and Mrs. Chick. Amen. Pastor or preacher. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been around for, let's say, uh, 10 years? Let's say longer than 10 years. How many of you ever went, hey, Brother Theron, how you doing? Raise your hand if you did. You, if you said, hey, Brother Theron. How many of you went up and said, hey, Joanne, how you doing? It's always been Brother Chick. Amen. It's always been Pastor. It's always been Mrs. Chick. To this day, you still call her Mrs. Chick. Why do we not show our pastor that same reverence, that same uh, respect? You said, well, he doesn't want it. Whether he wants it or not, he deserves it. You know, there's a lot of things we want in life that we don't necessarily get. Let's face it. And if it's one that's showing the utmost respect for you as a pastor, then that's something you're not going to get. I'm not going to call you Brother Terry. I'm going to call you Brother Chick just because you deserve the respect. You know? Whether, whether you like it or not, whether you like the gentleman or not, is beside the point. But the President of the United State, States has always been addressed as Mr. President, President last name, or, or something of the fact. You, you, you never hear somebody call them out by their first name, whether you like them or not. Is that not true? What do you do? You're honoring maybe not necessarily the man because you don't like him, but you might be honoring the office. You're respecting the office. Whether you like, whether you like him or not, you should respect the office, and we need to pray for the office. We need to protect our pastor and his wife. You know, many people will make him the bad guy. You know, standing behind this pulpit has put a big red target on his back. You say, why is that? Because, because he will openly condemn sin. He will openly come up and say, hey, if you die in your sin, you're dying and going to hell. You know, that's not a popular message. People want the feel good. And he'll stand up here and he'll condemn sin. 
People will badmouth him. Oh, that preacher over there. Oh, that preacher over there. When was the last time we stood up for him when that happens? When was the last time that somebody degraded your church that you stood up for your church? We as the congregation, we need to protect our pastor. We need to sit there. If we hear somebody bad mouthing our pastor or his wife, we need to step in and say, quit talking about my pastor that way. How would you feel if somebody talked about your God that way? Would you step in or would you let it just slide? I would hope you would step up and, and, and take offense to the fact that somebody's attacking your God. But we need to protect our pastor. We need to stand behind him. We need to stand up for him. We need to support our pastor. Now remember, this is just our responsibilities to, to our preacher. How many of you knew this before? How many of this, is this new to anybody? We all know this, but sometimes, like I said, it's good to rehearse. We need to support our pastor. If you would, turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. A time has come with the nation of Israel that they are at war. And this war that they're fighting is one that God has, has allowed them to involve themselves in. And we see in verse 8 that, of chapter 17 that they're fighting uh, uh, Amalek and they're, and they're fighting Israel. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose out men and go fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand atop of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Moses is taking the leadership here. And he says, okay, Joshua, go get you some men. You go fight. I'm going to go up to the top of the hill. And I'm going to have the, the, the uh, rod of God in my hand. I'm going to sit there and let people see that this is the Lord. You know, when we're fighting the world and when the world's fighting us, they're not fighting us, they're fighting the Lord. And so what does the pastor do? He stands up here at the Word of God and he opens the Word of God and he shows you how to have victory with the problems you're having through the Word of God. Well, let's see what happens. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Verse 11. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on, one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Let me tell you something tonight. When your pastor gets weary, we need to stand there. We need to have, as a church, we need to stand there. We need to hold his hands up in victory. He needs to know that we're right there with him. He gets tired. We'll pull a chair up, let him sit on it for a second. But we're right there with him. We need to let him see that, that we stand behind him. We're there to support him in everything he does and everything he says because he wants the word to go out. He doesn't want the lights to turn off here at Bible Baptist Church. And, the, and Joshua discomforted Amalek in verse 13 with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write for this a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. You say, why do they have victory? Because Aaron and Hur went up, to, went up to Moses and steadied his hand. Have you ever held somebody's arm up? You know that Aaron's hands got, and arms got tired. You know that Hur's hands got, uh, and his arms got tired because he's got full weight. Not only are they holding his hand up, but they're also ho holding the rod of God. Folks. When your pastor's standing up here and he's proclaiming the word of God and he goes down, he's completely wore out because he's given 110% behind this pulpit. We need to stand there and say, you know what, preacher, that's okay. I've got your arms. We'll keep you lifted up. Amen. You know what, I know you're not feeling good today, but let me tell you something. I'm praying for you and I'm helping hold your arm up. And when that person gets so weak that they can't hold the arm up again, we got somebody else coming right in so we can keep those arms lifted. And we can continue to see the lights go on here at Bible Baptist Church. We can continue to see souls being saved. We can continue seeing the baptismal water served. We can continue to see preachers being sent out. Why? Because we're all locked arms together for the furtherance of the gospel. That's what it's going to take. It's a constant fight against the world that he has. You know, people will put their, their, the weight of their world on his shoulders and he'll tell you that's fine all day long. And it is fine. That's part of the job of a pastor. 
But I want you to understand that when you put the, your weight upon his shoulders, he's going to take it as his weight and he will pray for it earnestly. He will love you earnestly. But let me ask you this. How many times have, have you as an individual gone to pastor and say, Pastor, what are some of your burdens that I can alleviate? What are some of the things that I can do to lighten your burden? How long has it been? Dare I say too long? Not only does he have his own personal needs, not only does he have his own family, he's got the whole weight of the, of the church on his shoulders. Again, I don't truly understand that because I am not the pastor. I'm with him enough that I can kind of see, but again, I don't fully understand. But I can see when he's on the phone and we're driving down, down Elm Street and he just starts crying because somebody's there on the phone and the, and the information they just gave him just broke his heart. Just made him sick. Say, why is that? Because somebody's placing their burden upon him. Which is fine. He's a pastor. He'll readily take it. You say, well, what can we do? Well, we need to support him not only in, in spiritual things, but we need to support him in material needs. In the book of 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. You turn in with me. 1 Timothy chapter 5. You know, it's uh, very difficult to do this because he's the type of pastor that will tell you he doesn't need anything or want anything. How many of you have been there? Hey, what can we do for you? Nothing. I'm good. But you know, every once in a while we can just slip something, even if it's just a note to tell, you, to tell him that you love him. You know, that might be what he needs during the day. I've had... Just me personally. Carrie's text me. Regina's text me. Just and Brother Tom's text me. Just, just to let me know that, that they're thankful that I'm their Sunday school teacher. Thank you for teaching us. I'm just a Sunday school teacher. That means a lot to me. And you never know what he's going through that you send him just a, a note of, Hey, Pastor, I want you to know right now I'm praying for you and I love you. What that will do for him. But in 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm in 1 Thessalonians, just a second. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of what? Is everybody there with me? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of what? Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Let me ask you something. Does your pastor rule well? Does he lead well? Does he open up the word of God? Does he teach spiritual doctrine? Is he worthy of double honor? Amen. Then why do we as a church slack in that? Why do we as a church not, not involve more of our blessings that we share with him? You know, we're, we're so ready to share the bad news, but we're not willing to share the good news. We're so willing to say, hey, I've got this trial, this problem. But we're not so willing to say, hey, pastor, just want you to know that God blessed me today by this. Or, hey, pastor, this, I read this first today. I just want you to know that it blessed me and I'm praying for you today. You know, that'll do more than you ever, ever know. We need to support him. We need to make his check-in joyous. You see, he does have to check his church in. How many of you knew that? As a pastor, he's got to check his church in. In Hebrews chapter 13, again in verse number 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they, might, as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for this is unprofitable for you. You know, only you as an individual know if you're easy to lead or if you're difficult to lead. But we as the congregation should not be so difficult that he can't lead us. We need, to, we need to follow his leadership. We need to, to lock arms, as I've said many times already tonight. We need, to, we need to let him know that, hey, whatever it is that you need, I'm willing to do. You see, that's part of the support. And, and I tell my Sunday school class this. If you see a need in God's house, that need revealed 
has just become an assignment given. The need revealed is an assignment given. If you see a need in God's house, don't take it for just one day. Take it and own it. You say, well, I see, I see that visitation needs to be done. Take that need and own it. Don't do it for a day. Don't do it for a week. Take it and tell pastor, hey, I see this needs to be done. Consider it taken care of. I will personally take care of it. You don't have to worry about it any longer. Hey, I noticed, I noticed that we don't have handshakers at the door. Hey, let me tell you, Pastor, that I'm going to be on this every service. I'll be here every service. I'll be early every service. And count me as a door greeter, and I will, I will do it with joy. There's nothing too small to serve God in, in his house. Nextly, we need to be loyal and support his support system. You know, he does have an excellent support system in his wife. How many of you think that he's got her 100% support? If you have any doubt, let me tell you right now, that come, come, come rain, come shine, come snow, come ice, come high water, come low water, come whatever it may be, come disaster, no matter what it is, he has her 100% support. You say, why is this? Because he is, she is his helpmeet. While he stands up here and proclaims the word of God, she's got his back no matter who comes at him. She's got his back no matter, no matter what darks may come, no matter what, what blow may come. She know, he knows that if he goes down, she's right there with him. When he's sick, she's there taking care of him. When, when he's gone, she's calling all the time asking how he's doing. You say, why? Because he has her support. One chapter sticks out. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 10 through 31. You see, ladies, if you need a good example, your pastor's wife is a good example on how to be loyal to the pastor, on how to live a life according to God. You know, again, she has his 100% support. I wonder how our support holds up. I wonder if we truly give our pastor and his wife the 100% support they deserve. I wonder if we give our, our pastor and his wife the 100% uh, percent of loyalty that they deserve. And you know what he's going to say? I guarantee you, don't think for a minute he's not going to watch this message because this is his church that God has given him and he wants to see what's going out. And rightly so. Don't think for a minute that he's going to like this because it's, I'm talking all about him. But it's not about him. It's about the God we serve and the, and the, and the man that God has placed right here behind this pulpit. You know what he wants? You know what's going to make him the happiest? How are you going to support your pastor? How about let's see souls saved every Sunday? How about let's build a church? How about let's have a revival? You want to make your pastor happy. If you're not saved here tonight, I want you to understand that, you're, that your pastor wants you saved. I don't care if you've come, if this is your first time. I don't care if you've been coming here for 50 years. If you're not saved, your pastor wants to see you saved. You need to understand that Christ came. He died on that old rugged cross. And he died for you personally. And you have to personally cry out to him, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me. And you too can be saved. That would make your pastor happy. As a Christian, you know what would make him happy? If we all lock arms together and when he comes home, we're ready to go. And he's going to stay here. He's going to be all rested up and we're going to be tired because we're tonight we decide that we're going to start working our hardest we've ever worked for God because God is coming back again. And we want to be found a church that doesn't have Ichabod written over the door. We want to be a church that's found faithful in the sight of God. And what are we going to do tonight? We need a purpose in our hearts to set that revival. Tonight we need a purpose in our hearts that we're going to love and support our pastor because we as a church cannot be blessed if we do not love and support our pastor. We as a church cannot be blessed if we don't go above and beyond for our pastor. Why? Because remember them that have the rule over you. Esteem them highly for the work's sake. 
Where does your loyalty lie? Does your loyalty lie in coming to church just so you don't have to get that knock on the door and to say, hey, we missed you? Does your loyalty lie just because it's a Sunday we come? Do we come? Do we come with an open heart, with an open mind, ready to receive that which our pastor proclaims out from this pulpit, that God has something for us each and every service? What do we do? Is this just a time that we come to see our friends? Is this just a time we come because our parents make us? Is this a time we come just because, or is this a time that we come ready to receive something good from the Lord? You want to make your pastor happy. You want to show respect and honor to your pastor that we need to serve God 100%. We need to show loyalty not to our, only to our pastor and his wife. We need to show loyalty to Bible Baptist Church. That will make him happy. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, the matter of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be found faithful in every service the church has. We need to be faithful in every ministry the, the church has. We're able to go back to our nursing home. You know what? We need to have people say, hey, guess what? I need to be there because I'm supporting the preachers that are going out and preaching there. I need, to, I, need to, I need to come to the visitation meeting because not only do I want to support the church, I, don't, I want to support the pastor, but I want to support those lost people that need to be saved. Amen. You see, it's what it takes. It takes all of us 100% supporting not only the pastor, not only Bible Baptist Church, but showing loyalty to God. Amen. And when we start showing loyalty to God, you'll start showing loyalty to the church and when you start showing loyalty to the church, your pastor will have the loyalty that he deserves. Amen. It all comes down to how do you stand with your God? Tonight, if you're not serving your God to your fullest, tonight, purpose in your heart to serve God. Tonight, if you're not saved, come down to these old-fashioned altars and accept Christ as your Savior. And we will truly see God work in our mists. How many of you want to see God work in the mists? How many do you want to come in and you want to, you want to sense, hear the Holy Spirit present in our building? Amen. I do. It all comes down to one word. Loyalty. Being steadfast in allegiance to a person, place, or thing. Where's your loyalty lie? Let's all stand, hand, heads bowed, eyes closed. This was nothing new tonight. I want you to know right now your pastor loves you. I want you to know right now your pastor's wife loves you. I want you to know right now they want you to be saved and they want you serving 100% your God. What choice will you make tonight? Our Father, as we close now in prayer, we do thank you for our pastor. 22 years of service he's given us thus far. Eight years as senior pastor. Father, we pray that you continue to bless him and his wife as they're in, in their work for you. Father, we can pray that you be with us as, as your church. Help us to lock arms. Help us to, to love him. Help us to serve with him. Father, to see your work go out. Father, we the church, we love our pastor. You know we do. Father, we know sometimes just a remembrance is a bitter pill to swallow. But Father, I pray that tonight we'll purpose in our hearts as a church, yes, but Father, us individually to serve you and love you better than we ever have before. Father, I pray tonight if there's somebody here that doesn't know your son is Savior, that even right now as we're praying, they'll walk down these aisles. Father, and they'll kneel down, they'll, they'll let somebody open your word. And we can see them bow their head and bow their knee to you and accept Christ as Savior. Again, we love you. We thank you for our pastor. Be with this invitation. Father, may Satan be defeated. May Christ be honored. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Two verse